Thank you, uh, David. It's a real privilege to be here in, uh, at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. I have to especially thank um, my uh, childhood friend, Charlie Edel, who is a uh, professor here at the War College who helped make this possible. Um, he is now has a fellowship at the State Department, so he's not able to be here, but I'm very grateful to him and to be here where there have been um, uh, many uh, distinguished uh, speakers. It's a real honor, including uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who made the famous speech about sea power just for the Spanish-American War. But uh, this is a two-part uh, presentation. One is a book which I have already written about the great ship, the SS United States, built in the 1950s at the high water mark of the American century when this ship was a, uh, an expression not just of, uh, of luxury travel, but also of military prowess, because she was built not just as a luxury liner, but as a secret weapon able to be converted from a 2,000 passenger luxury liner carrying you know, rich people, Hollywood stars, you name it, and all the way to immigrants to an entire army division of 14,000 men. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's the steamship era, that's the 20th century, but then I'm gonna go back uh, another 100 years to the book I'm currently working on, also about fast ships, the uh, clipper ship era. And in many ways there are similarities between the SS United States and wonderful tall ships like the Flying Cloud, Romance of the Seas, I mean they both have, they all, all these ships have wonderful names. But uh, let's uh, start uh, with a, uh, if I can get it to work. Just the uh, arrow key. Yeah. Hey, that should work. It was working before. Technical difficulty. Oh. <laughs> this, this generally happens. <laughs> of course. We used to use view graphs. <laughs> <laughs> You saw me do it before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing you had to worry about then is the bulk of it. We weren't even on the internet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reboot. Government computer. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. Great. Um, well, this is the uh, image that uh, initially captivated me when I started working on a man a ship in 2007. And uh, there were many great ocean liners built, uh, the most infamous or famous of which was the Titanic of 1912, that, which was one of three ships uh, that was actually built uh, thanks to the financing of not by British people, but by J.P. Morgan. The Titanic FY was completely American owned. Uh, but this image is unusual because you do have someone who is deeply connected with the construction of a great transatlantic liner. Uh, this is William Francis Gibbs staring at his creation as she was coming into New York Harbor in uh, a chilly uh, fall day in October of 1957. And uh, this was something he would do every two weeks when the ship would come in from her return trip from Europe. He would get up very early in the morning and drive over to the pier and watch her come in and he'd be the first person to come on board. He spent 40 years designing this ship. It's something he wanted to do since he was a very young man, since his 20s. And this ship was, came at a time when ocean liners were the peak of technology. Uh, this ship was uh, almost three football fields long, 990 feet long, 101 feet wide. Why those dimensions? She could just squeeze into the Panama Canal. So if she was to be used as a military ship, she could make that passage. And this ship had uh, the ability to travel at over 38 knots, top sustained speed. And uh, her engines were 240,000 horsepower, uh, almost a third more powerful than any comparable ocean liner, including the Queen Mary. The reason for these am amazing statistics was that she was not just a beautiful uh, luxury liner built to carry uh, movie stars. She was built to be a military ship, first and foremost. Uh, William Francis Gibbs, I believe, was one of the great designers on land or sea uh, that America has ever produced. And this was the magic moment for him. This was in 1894 uh, in Philadelphia when a passenger ship called the SS St. Louis was launched at the Cramp Yards. And William Francis Gibbs and his father are somewhere in that crowd. And when he was eight years old, he saw that ship being launched. He knew from that moment, I know what to do with my life. Uh, his father had other ideas. His father was a very successful Philadelphia uh, financier and banker who wanted his son to be a proper Philadelphia lawyer. Uh, William Francis Gibbs had no intention of being a proper Philadelphia lawyer. Uh, he fought his father and mother tooth and nail 
uh, to become a naval architect. Uh, he ended up enrolling at Harvard University where he dropped out when his very wealthy father, it turned out, was a crook and had been stealing money from one of his companies that had gone bankrupt. So William Francis Gibbs ultimately finishes college. He, has, he works his way through college and through law school. And after a few years of teaching, as, uh, working as a lawyer, he ends up getting an apprenticeship with a gentleman called Admiral David W. Taylor, uh, who was one of the uh, top naval architects of the US Navy. Uh, D Admiral David W. Taylor um, uh, was inspired by this young man. I mean, he clearly was very smart, loved ships, was passionate about ships. Uh, he uh, basically received, gave Gibbs the training that he never formally received in college. So Gibbs uh, ended up starting a naval architecture firm with his uh, younger brother Frederick and with Admiral David W. Taylor in the 1920s. And uh, he ended up marrying a lady named Vera Cravath Larkin, as in the law firm Cravath, Swain and Moore in New York. And uh, here he is as a very, the picture on the left shows him as a very unhappy undergraduate at Harvard. He was miserable. He was bullied uh, when he was an undergraduate because he was constantly reading books about ships and uh, constantly doodling in class of ship designs. And he was not very social. But eventually he ended up on the cover of Time magazine for his work as a naval architect during World War II. And this shows him uh, on the, uh, uh, sitting on the ventilator of, of one of his uh, ocean liners, the SS America of 1940, wearing his characteristically very crummy, cheap clothing, cracked shoes, his hats had holes in them. He was very much an eccentric. And uh, he uh, also was known to having a very salty tongue and uh, was known as a very hard driving man. Uh, as one observer said, because he got a later start in the career he wanted to do, he had to work extra hard to achieve what he wanted to achieve. Uh, he, uh, his firm achieved prominence in the 1930s during the FDR administration when they designed a series of destroyers that were, that were the first American warships to use high temperature, high pressure steam, which gave this set of destroyers um, a top speed of close to 40 knots. And during the Second World War, they were able to outsail anything the Japanese, the Germans could produce. But during the war, he was most famous for coming up with basically adapting the designs of a British tramp steamer and turning it into the Model T of cargo ships, the Humble Liberty ship. His firm came up with a prototype so that these ships could be mass produced, and over 2,000 of them were produced. And the thinking was, build them faster than the Nazis can sink them. <laughs> Uh, but Gibbs' real dream as a naval architect was to build a grand transatlantic ocean liner. This was the crown jewel of any naval architect's dream. The problem was, as an American naval architect, it was a very hard thing to do because in Europe, the government, the French government, the British governments, the German governments, etc., were providing steamship companies with subsidies to build luxury liners. These were points of national pride. America did not offer subsidies for transatlantic steamship companies to build these bigger, faster, and grander ships. But as you can see, uh, these ships were not just engineering marvels. They were also uh, cultural icons. They had the advertised glamour. I mean, the French line especially appealed to wealthy Americans and their sense of what traveling on a French ship was like. And if you look at the names uh, of ships that were from the 1890s all the way to the 1940s, these are names that reflect nationalistic pride. Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, Rex, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa. Very nationalistic names, very different from cruise ship names today. Uh, these were also floating palaces. Uh, one thing you might not know about the RMS Titanic of 1912 was that she and her two sister ships had the first floating squash courts on board. They were that big. Uh, most of these ships, are, almost all of them are gone. There's still some remnants of what these ships used to look like. This is the first class lounge of the RMS Olympic, the sister ship of the Titanic, when the Olympic was scrapped in the 1930s a hotel owner bought the first class lounge and put it in his hotel. That's all solid oak, by the way, hand carved by the workers at Holland and Wolf in Belfast. Uh, but the most important thing about these ships was their speed. This was the fastest way, to, this is the only way to cross the Atlantic uh, before airplanes came along. So the faster people took ships, not just to cruise, but to go from point A to point B. This is a shot of the Queen Mary, the famous Queen Mary of 1936, going through the North Atlantic at over 33 knots. Uh, this ship is, is actually bigger than the SS United States, but when she came in for her maiden voyage in uh, 1936, airplanes uh, would circle around her to get a shot of this magnificent ship in action. And the Queen Mary uh, held the transatlantic speed record from 1936 to 1952, 
and she was able to make a top speed of 31 knots and she crossed in three days and 20 hours. So back then that was considered very fast and, and uh, over the uh, course of the late 19th, early 20th century, it, the time it took to cross the Atlantic shrank from a week to four days. And that was seen as, the, uh, as uh, a real ad uh, advance. Uh, but in the construction of a lot of these ocean liners, a lot of things went wrong. I don't need to go over the Titanic. Uh, uh, you had uh, the issues of compartmentation. Were these ships adequately compartmented? The Titanic, when she hit that iceberg, opened a third of her length. That was more than enough to sink the ship. The Lusitania uh, had probably had either a coal explosion or, uh, or a steam plant explosion. It might have been something else she was carrying during World War I, but when that torpedo hit, something blew up. Uh, but Gibbs, when he followed these passenger designer, uh, these passenger liner disasters, was particularly concerned with fire. He said there is no greater danger to a passenger ship than a catching fire because passengers and crew are trapped on board. In 1934, a cruise ship uh, that sailed between New York and Havana, the M Morro Castle, which was designed by one of his rivals, caught fire off the coast of New Jersey and was burning with, from stem to stern. Uh, within half an hour. The reason was that she was very luxuriously outfitted with woods and heavy drapes and when that ship caught fire uh, she uh, was uh, basically within half an hour became a floating fire trap and the passengers couldn't escape. Out of the 600 people on board, 130 people died. Uh, the Normandy was probably the most famous uh, passenger ship fire. This was a French liner that was the pride of uh, France basically as a engineering and decoration and artistic marvel and in 1942 while being converted into a troop transport after she'd been seized by the US uh, caught fire only a few hours before she was set to set sail with her first load of troops and sank at her New York pier it was a total loss and uh, Gibbs inspected the uh, Normandy in 1942 when she was lying on her side and he said if I ever get a chance to design my superliner I do not. W I want it to be as fireproof as possible. I don't want this to happen. And the naval architect who designed the Normandy saw her burn and was in tears. He was devastated. Uh, but what really made the construction of the SS United States possible was the use of these types of big ocean liners in wartime. This is footage of the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary, the two great Cunarders uh, so that, that would sail back and forth between uh, Europe and America during the the Second World War. These ships were built to carry 3,000 passengers, biggest ships in, of their time. They were able to smush 16,000 men onto these ships and they would sail them at full speed, 30 plus knots. No escorts could keep up with them. So if something did happen and a submarine did get the ship in its sights, it would have been a disaster. In fact, Adolf Hitler uh, said he would give $250,000, the equivalent of that, and an Iron Cross to any U-boat commander that sank the Queen Elizabeth or the Queen Mary when fully loaded. Thankfully, their speed protected them. Now, after the war, um, in 1945, William Francis Gibbs meets up with uh, officials from the U.S. government, especially the U.S. Navy, and says, we need a ship just like the Queen Elizabeth and the Queen Mary, able to be used for wartime. So here he is uh, meeting with his brother around this time, and uh, the uh, the criteria for this type of ship was she must have a slim hull with a low prismatic coefficient, very narrow. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, prismatic coefficient for the ship was five, uh, 0.59, which was almost the equivalent of that of a destroyer. Uh, she had to have a low center of gravity so she would remain stable in rough seas and when fully loaded with troops. And she must have a high margin of stability in case of flooding. And there'd be almost no wood used in her construction to prevent fire. Uh, and how to achieve that? Well, during the Second World War, the use of aluminum had been pioneered in the construction of destroyers and cruisers. So William Francis Gibbs said, let's take the, all the upper decks of this ship and make them entirely out of aluminum. That would add tremendously to the cost. Uh, no wood uh, at all in any of the furniture, any of the paneling. Uh, there would be no expansion joints, which would, ca that which would uh, cause problems. And the ship would be able to remain afloat with any five or 20 watertight compartments flooded. That is a standard yet to be matched in passenger ships. If you might remember from the Titanic, that ship was built with 16 watertight compartments, any two of which could be flooded, or the first four. Well, that iceberg ripped open the first six, and she went down. 
And uh, just one analogy I like to use is the construction of an ocean liner is like taking the Chrysler building, turning on its side, putting in a luxury hotel, putting in a power plant that could power any major city, and then pushing it through the Atlantic at over 40 miles an hour. Uh, the design and planning uh, took five years to build this ship. Uh, and uh, she was the third, she would be the third largest passenger liner in the world. Not as big as the Queen Elizabeth or the Queen Mary, but still pretty big. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main design parameters was that she would be able to fit through the Panama Canal. <coughs> now these engines were later used, the engines used in the SS United States were later used in the Forrestal class aircraft carriers. Uh, and able to generate 240,000 horsepower and uh, four propellers, uh, basically very similar to aircraft carrier battleship design. But unlike other passenger liners, where if you were traveling on the ship and you wanted to see the engine room, you couldn't do that on this ship because everything below the water line, the engine rooms, the hull design was all government classified. Well, a uh, problem comes up during the 19, early 1950s when the ship is under construction because the Korean War breaks out just as soon as her keel plates are laid. And uh, a ship is already put as being built in the slipway designated for her. This is the aircraft carrier USS United States, which they began constructing uh, in early 1950. And this was the first, this was to be the first flush deck aircraft carrier. And here are the keel plates being laid in Newport News, Virginia for the USS United States. The problem was that there was, uh, the Truman administration began cutting back on military funding around this time. This led to the famous uh, revolt of the admirals in which uh, the Secretary of the Navy resigned along with many other uh, naval officials. So the keel plates for this ship were scrapped. And in its place, they began laying the keel plates of the ocean liner SS United States. Construction began in February of 1950. And because so many sections of the ship were prefab, uh, she was uh, finished pretty quickly. And she was christened and floated out of dry dock on June 23rd, 1951. There was a bit of a financial problem, however, with this ship. There was a bit of a scandal. A typical passenger liner of this size would cost around $50 million. Well, because this ship had so many military features built into her, the aluminum superstructure, double electrical wiring, the extra compartmentation, costs skyrocketed, and they ended up totaling more than $78 million. The company that was to be operating her, the United States Lines, was only paying for $28 million of this. So uh, some people in Congress uh, began investigating this, and the president himself got involved and said, we think the US Lines, which is run by such powerful men as Vincent Astor and other New York capitalists, has been bilking the government to build this ocean liner. So this fight over the ship's uh, construction lasts all the way to the maiden voyage. Uh, here's some construction photos of the SS United States in Newport News. You get a sense of the scale of this ship. Uh, these propellers were made out of a manganese bronze alloy. They're 19 feet in diameter and could turn at over 160 RPM. So that's a, it's a, this, these are, this is a pretty um, impressive setup for a ship like this. And each of these four propellers was designed to take 60,000 horsepower. So that's a lot of torque on uh, those propellers. And one of the concerns with this design was vibration. A lot of passenger liners suffered from very bad vibration at high speed. So the trick was, how do you design propellers that minimize vibration? Well, the design team for the SS United States from William Francis Gibbs's firm consisted of 49 men and one woman. Elaine Kaplan was the woman engineer responsible for designing these propellers, which <laughs> proved to uh, minimize vibration. Uh, this shows one of the aluminum smokestacks of the ship. Uh, these are 10 1950 Fords lined up against those, those smokestacks that give a sense of scale. Those fins were meant to deflect smoke from blowing onto the after decks. Uh, this shows the SS United States being floated out of dry dock in June 1951. Uh, unlike previous ships which slid down the ways and into the uh, James River, because the ship's underwater hull was classified, she was built in dry dock and already floating uh, when she was christened by um, the wife of sex, uh, Texas, Kennedy, uh, Sexus, uh, sorry, Texas Senator uh, John Connolly. Uh, Bess Truman, First Lady of the United States, was offered to uh, christen the ship, 
But her husband said, no, because of the scandal of what's going on with the ship's construction, you're not allowed to launch it. <coughs> now, if you can't use wood, uh, you have to be very creative with uh, your interior decorations. Uh, the ship was divided into three separate and very unequal classes. She was one of the last of the transatlantic liners to be divided into first, second, and third. And uh, first class was located in the center of the ship where you felt the least motion. And uh, to go first class in a ship like this was expensive. It cost maybe the equivalent of five to $10,000 per person one way. 800 people in first class. And as you can see, when you have very little wood, you have, you have to use a lot of aluminum, you have to use a lot of steel. Uh, those sculptures you see in the first class dining room are actually made of a kind of styrofoam. So a lot of people looked, walked on board the ship for the first time and either thought it was supremely modern and really liked it, or they thought it was really ugly. Uh, this is second class, located in the back of the ship. And if you get seasick, you don't want to be back here. This is uh, a tourist class or third class in the front of the ship. This is where you feel the most motion. Now, the maiden voyage took place in uh, July of 1952. It was a major media event. Everyone was wondering whether this ship had enough horsepower to take the record for the first, uh, on her first crossing from the Queen Mary. Usually transatlantic liners did not go for the transatlantic record on their first trips because the engines had not been broken in, the crews weren't ready. But uh, Commodore Manning, who was captain of the SS United States on this voyage, was pretty confident. In fact, he had a meeting with William Francis Gibbs the day before the ship was set to sail. And William Francis Gibbs said, please, if you're going to break the record of the Queen Mary, do not do so by very much. We do not want the British to know. And above all, we don't want the Russians to know what the ship can do because she's a military vessel. Uh, well, on July 3rd, 1952, the ship is fully booked with 2,000 passengers, including, oddly enough, the daughter of, um, uh, of uh, Harry Truman, uh, Margaret Truman's on board. You have David Sarnoff, the president of uh, CBS. Uh, you have uh, Fritz Reiner, the conductor of the Chicago Philharmonic. You have various members of the Astor family on board. And uh, it's interesting to note out the Astors because Vincent Astor was the chairman of the board of the uh, United States Lines. He was the biggest investor in the company. Vincent Astor always wore, he was a very dour, eccentric individual. Uh, he wore a gold pocket watch at all times. Now this gold pocket watch had great sentimental significance to him because that gold pocket watch was recovered from his father's body floating in the North Atlantic in 1912. His father, Colonel John Jacob Astor IV, died on the Titanic. So the ship is set to sail in New York. It is one of these great uh, occasions. This was a time when friends of passengers and family of passengers could come on board and drink champagne. There was no security. You could just wander on board if you wanted to. And uh, at 12 noon on July 3rd, 1952, as streamers were flying from her uh, promenade decks and crowds were waving goodbye, she backs into the Hudson River by tugs and sails out past the Statue of Liberty. And the question is, is Harry Manning going to keep a moderate degree of speed on this ship? What do you think he does as soon as he clears Verrazano? <laughs> He's making 35 knots <laughs> with 3,000 people on board. Uh, the, uh, William Francis Gibbs is not amused. The president of U.S. Lines is really nervous. What if something goes wrong? You're really pushing this ship on her maiden voyage. Well, she behaves wonderfully. She does not have any technical problems. Then as she's approaching, uh, on her third day out, as she's approaching the English coast, they hit a 60 or 70 mile an hour gale blowing right in their faces. What do you think he does? Well, he increases speed to 37 knots. And uh, the, he is really pushing this ship, and the ship is rolling back and forth. I mean, she's built very much like a military vessel, unlike other passenger ships, which are you know, built for stability. She is a very sharp roller, and she's definitely scaring some of the passengers, but Manning keeps on pushing her. And at 6.15 in the morning, on July 7, 1952, the SS United States sweeps past Bishop's Rocks um, on the coast of England and takes the record away from the Queen Mary with a, to a top speed of 35.59 knots and uh, makes the crossing in three days, 10 hours, and 40 minutes, smashing the Queen Mary's record by 10 hours. She drops off her passengers in Le Havre, France that night, uh, spends the night in Le Havre, France, and sails over to Southampton, England, and makes a triumphant arrival into that port. And uh, the reporters gather around Commodore Marining and uh, William Francis Gibbs, 
and say, gentlemen, how do you feel about this triumph? An American passenger ship has not held the record since 1852. Commodore Manning says very confidently, I really don't see what the big deal is, just to let you know we were only doing two-thirds power. <laughs> <laughs> Commodore Manning is fired on the next voyage for, uh, uh, as, when he leaves Southampton Harbor uh, on that second voyage, he pulls up rather close to the Queen Elizabeth and zooms right past her. Uh, it was considered very bad manners uh, for if one passenger ship is passing another to go up close. You did it from a respectful distance. Well, Commodore Manning said, uh, let me show you what I can do. And I think that might have been in response to the British newsreel saying, oh, we don't know what the Queen Elizabeth can do. She has not been opened up to full speed. And Commodore Manning was saying, oh, yeah, well, watch this. <laughs> and uh, this picture down here shows uh, Margaret Truman at 6.15 in the morning uh, shaking the hands of a very tired Commodore Manning on the bridge of the SS United States at the very moment she breaks the record. Uh, Commodore Manning uh, in this newsreel footage basically stumbles off in the distance because he is, had not slept for uh, about two days and had lost 10 pounds. So here's footage of her pulling into um, uh, La Havre, France, showing all the crowds of French well-wishers watching her coming through the La Havre breakwater. And this uh, very uh, beautiful image, I think, uh, shows her coming into New York on her return, the return leg of her maiden voyage. And lashed to her mast are a, is a big blue pennant to symbolize the blue riband, as are two brooms painted silver to show a clean sweep. Uh, so what was it like to travel on the ship in the 1950s and early 60s when she was the most popular transatlantic liner of her day? Well, once again, even though this is the 1950s and propeller planes are starting to cross the uh, Atlantic at regular intervals, uh, most people were on board to go from point A to point B. They were, um, you had among the wealthy people on board, they were Hollywood stars going to film shoots. Here's John Wayne on the bridge of the ship with her second captain, uh, Commodore uh, Anderson. Uh, Judy Garland here is uh, shown uh, with, her, I forgot which husband it was, and uh, <laughs> one of many. Uh, Salvador Dali was a very uh, uh, frequent passenger in the SS United States and he was known to walk his pet ocelot on the promenade deck of when he was traveling on, uh, on transatlantic ships and passengers saw him walking this big cat and ran away in terror. Uh, but this, all, this picture on the uh, lower right shows that even in the winter this ship was meant to keep a schedule and this shows the ship caked in ice after a very rough transatlantic crossing. But the ship did not just carry wealthy people. Uh, she, had two, uh, she had three classes, and you had a lot of people who came over to the ship uh, as immigrants, uh, traveling in, an, in tourist class. And for them, this was the start of a new life. Uh, one of the gentlemen who immigrated to America on the SS United States was um, a very famous artist called David McCauley, the author of Cathedral, Castle, The Way Things Work. He traveled over on the SS United States as a 10-year-old with his family who was immigrating over from a very battered post-war England. They were seeking a new life. And uh, he is now currently working on his own book on the SS United States that will inc include his characteristic illustrations. Uh, one of the great joys of this project has been interviewing all the former crew members, or not all of them, but many former crew members, uh, who uh, for them this ship was their home, their employment, their college, all rolled into one. And uh, Bill Crudner uh, and Joe Rota have been especially helpful in this project. And uh, uh, Joe Rota told me a very interesting story that involved a great Navy man, the father of the nuclear Navy, Commodore, uh, uh, Admiral uh, Rickover. And Joe Rota was a radio uh, uh, bellboy. He would deliver messages from the radio room to passenger staterooms. And uh, one day he was walking along the deck carrying messages and he sees six officers on the bridge all with binoculars. And he looks at that, that's interesting, I haven't seen that before. And then he sees a submarine conning tower pop up. And this submarine is not your ordinary diesel submarine, it is keeping speed, 32 knots, with the SS United States, and she's circling the SS United States. <laughs> and then she goes down, after flashing her lights, and then goes down. And then Joe Roto goes to the radio operator and says, what was that? The radio operator says, oh, you didn't see anything. You didn't see anything. <laughs> well, um, about six hours later, Joe Rota says he met, he met with the radio operator. Says, oh, I can tell you who that was. That was Admiral Rickover in the USS Nautilus. And she was uh, 
doing a little military exercise on us. And also, she, he was signaling from the Morse lamp to wish Mrs. Rickover, who was on board the SS United States, a happy birthday. <laughs> uh, what what uh, Admiral Rickover was really doing was he was trying to find out what the top speed of the SS United States was and trying to compare a steam-driven ship with a nuclear-powered ship. And Admiral Hyman Rickover marched up to uh, one of the Gibbs and Cox designers soon after this voyage and said, you know who I am, tell me what the top speed of the SS United States is. Well, the uh, designer had the very unfortunate news to report, Mr. Admiral Rickover, you're not on the need to know list. <laughs> Those of you who know Admiral Rickover, he had a bit of a temper and that guy almost lost his job. Um, well, William Francis Gibbs uh, never traveled on the SS United States again. He only made that one voyage. Until he was a very old man, he would continue to watch this ship uh, come in uh, until he got very ill in 1967 and he died uh, at the age of 81. The day after that, the SS United States sailed past his offices at, um, in Lower Manhattan and blew a salute uh, and dipped her flags in tribute. And uh, thank God William Francis Gibbs never got to see what actually happened to his ship. Because by the late 1960s, the transatlantic era was over. In 1958, the first transatlantic jet flies from New York's Idlewild Airport to Paris Orly and cuts the flying time. A propeller plane took 10 hours to fly across the Atlantic. Bumpy, uncomfortable, noisy. You might have to stop in Ireland to refuel. Not very economical or very comfortable. But the jet changes everything in 1958. You can fly seamlessly from New York to Paris in six hours. Six hours versus three days, 10 hours, 40 minutes. What would you rather take? Well, first, the jet planes take away the very wealthy. All of a sudden, the ships like the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mary, the Ile de France, the United States, uh, many others, their first class areas grow empty. And then by the mid-60s, jet travel becomes cheap enough that anyone can travel on board, and all these ships suffer. One by one, they're pulled out of service. Some are repurposed as cruise ships. Most, especially the ones built before World War II, are sent to the scrap heap. In 1969, uh, the United States Congress announces that they are no longer going to provide any sort of operational subsidy for the United States lines, and specifically the SS United States, because by that time, there was no need to have a big troop ship. We were now flying our troops to theaters such as Vietnam. So they cut the subsidy. The United States lines said, we can't afford to operate this ship anymore. By this time, a ship built to carry 2,000 passengers in three classes is now regularly carrying maybe only six to 700. So the, the, the writing was on the wall, no matter how fast she was. So in 1969, she is uh, laid up and uh, in Newport News, Virginia, mothballed, hermetically sealed, fully intact, and let to sit for years and years and years until in 1979, the uh, U.S. Navy declassifies all the ship's once top secret design aspects. Her hull design, her engine design, it's all revealed. People were always wondering, what was the top speed of the SS United States? There are people on board during her sea trials who claim they're on board and she did 50 knots. Uh, well, that is actually physically impossible. It turned out her top speed was, her top sustained speed was 38.32 knots uh, during her trials in 1952. But by that time, it had become an academic exercise to design a ship like that. In 1984, she was sold to a real estate developer uh, who planned to operate her as a floating and, and cruising uh, a condominium development. Well, he ultimately sells off everything inside the ship to quote unquote raise money for this development. He goes bankrupt in the mid 90s. The ship uh, begins to really deteriorate. In 1992, she is sold to another operator who tows her across uh, the North Atlantic to Turkey. Now, one of the uh, dirty secrets of the SS United States was that in order to make her fireproof, instead of using wood, they used asbestos. She was the world's largest use of asbestos up to that time. Wall boards, everything was loaded with asbestos. So they took her across the Atlantic and ripped out all that asbestos, tons and tons and tons of it. And unfortunately, Greenpeace labeled this ship the ship of death. She was no longer the pride of the American Merchant Marine. Uh, she was towed back across the Atlantic in 1996 after be being thoroughly stripped and was docked in Philadelphia and she's been there ever since. 
Uh, as I said, the interior contents of the ship have been scattered to the four winds, sold at auction. Uh, this stuff, this mid-century modern stuff, now sells for lots and lots of money. Uh, there was a time when people don't, didn't like this sort of stuff, but now chairs, tables, furniture, uh, silverware uh, now sells for astronomical prices. <laughs> Uh, a lot of it is in private collect collections. Some of it is in the, in the uh, Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia. In uh, 2010, uh, she was again up for sale by Norwegian Cruise Lines, who had planned to redo the ship as a modern U.S. flag vessel, but then the uh, Great Recession hit and devastated the um, uh, world economy, and they put her up for sale and put her up for sale for scrap. Uh, miraculously, just before all bids were due for the ship to be sent to maybe India, just like the SS France shown here um, in 2008, a Philadelphia philanthropist called uh, Jerry Lenfest, whose father who had been a naval architect who designed portions of the SS United States' watertight doors. He was a multi-billionaire who had made his fortune in cable and was also a Navy veteran. He uh, offered $5.8 million for the SS United States to be saved and she was sold uh, in, in uh, 2011 uh, to the SS United States Conservancy, who now plans to redevelop her as a stationary attraction. This shows her all lit up for the first time in years uh, when that announcement was made. Well, unfortunately, uh, Jerry Lenfest's money has now um, been, is now depleted because it was used for maintenance costs, and now the question, the future of the ship is now up in question again. Uh, I hope she's saved. I think it would be like losing Penn Station all over again, considering how much effort and love and attention went into the ship. As one maritime historian said, this ship was built like a European cathedral. She's built to last forever. She's 63 years old. Most passenger liners don't make it past 30. And she's still in, considering the rust, uh, beneath that rust, she's structurally in very good shape. Now I'd like to uh, touch uh, briefly uh, on the rest of this uh, presentation on the book I'm now working on, uh, tentatively a entitled Full Sail, another alternative title is American Speed, going back from the 1950s to the 1850s when the American merchant marine was truly preeminent on the world stage. And we were the envy of England, especially, not trying to catch up to England like we were during the transatlantic era. This is the great clipper ship Great Republic uh, designed by the great Bostonian naval architect Donald McKay. Uh, this ship was 300 and over 300 feet long and uh, weighed, grossed in at 4,500 tons, which is the biggest merchant ship of her time, and she was built entirely on speculation, either to sail around uh, Cape Horn for the California gold trade or to sail to Australia for the uh, Australian gold rush. It was a time of absolute exuberance in the American merchant marine. Uh, people often ask me, what is the, where, what's the origination of the term clipper? Well, uh, the first uh, literary use of the term clip it appears in one of John, the English poet John Dryden's uh, poems describe how a, a falcon clips through the air. And the definition of a clipper ship is a sailing ship with at least three masts uh, that is built, built where speed is the primary function, and often at the sacrifice of cargo capacity. Uh, the book uh, that I'm working on will focus uh, very heavily on the development of New York City during the uh, early and mid 19th century where the Erie Canal transforms New York uh, into the nation's foremost shipping port and uh, basically allows all the goods of the American heartland to flow through New York at the expense of Boston and Philadelphia. And most of the great clipper ships uh, sailed out of New York City. A lot of them were built in Boston, but most of them were registered and built and owned by New Yorkers. Uh, one important innovation that the New Yorkers came up with, and these ships were predecessors to the Clippers, were the transatlantic packet ships. These are the ships that sailed on regularly scheduled crossings across the Atlantic. And in 1817, a group of four Quaker merchants, and the Quakers play a very important part of the story. Um, a lot of them were formerly in the whaling business, and they began investing in transatlantic and, uh, ships. Uh, they launched a line of packets called the Black Ball Line, named for the black ball on their uh, topsail, fore topsail. And these ships would sail you know, on a regularly scheduled departure twice a month. Before that, if you wanted to catch a ship to England, you had to wait around until the captain decided it was time to sail, or you had to wait around until the, uh, the ship was full of cargo. The Black Ball Line said, no, for predictability, we want our ships to sail twice a month, and that way you uh, 
people who are shipping freight or passengers could plan their schedules around this departure. But in the age of sail, you couldn't depend on regular scheduled arrivals. You, it would take anywhere from six weeks to three months across the Atlantic, especially in the winter. Uh, I'm going to cover also some of the great merchants who built these, uh, these, uh, these clipper ships and were involved in the age of sail. Uh, they were strong personalities. A lot of them were very, very aggressive businessmen by uh, today's standards. A lot of them were interrelated. Uh, one of whom I'm focusing on is a gentleman named Warren Delano from Fa Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Uh, he uh, sailed to China in 1832 as a young man to make his fortune and eventually owned the first clipper ship to sail to California in 1849. He is the grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Someone asked uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, by the way, what is the secret to your political success? And he quoted a very common and favorite phrase of his grandfather, the clipper merchant Warren Delano. I never let my right hand know what my left hand is doing. Why is that? Well, the China trade was a very closed and often very shady uh, operation in which young men from New England, from cities like Newport, from cities like Fairhaven, New Bedford, would go and try their luck in the American and European foreign trading colony in Canton at that time in the early 19th century, the only Chinese city open to trade. And Americans wanted tea. They wanted lots of tea. They also wanted uh, uh, porcelain and other exotic uh, exports from China. And uh, the godfather of all these Chinese merchants was a gentleman called Hukwa, who at the time was the richest merchant in the world in the 1830s. He was worth approximately $26 million, which would make him the equivalent of a multi-multi-billionaire today. And he trained a whole generation of American merchants, like Warren Delano, uh, like Samuel Russell, who's was he later ended up founding uh, Wesleyan University and Yale University. Well, he didn't found it, but he funded a lot of Yale University. And these firms were all, Russell and Company, A.A. Lowen Brothers, Griswold, Grinnell and Minturn, a lot of them were all interrelated. New England families who moved down to New York, married each other, and were involved in the China trade. Now the key with tea, especially, was that uh, tea needed to be shipped to America as quickly as possible or else it would spoil. The faster a ship arrived in New York, the higher prices it commanded. Well, America didn't have a whole lot of things that we wanted to, that the Chinese wanted to buy. So the Americans came up with something that the British had come up with earlier. Why not ship them opium? So the British had cornered the Indian opium market. That was closed to Americans. So American traders like uh, Warren Delano, like the Forbes family, uh, like the Lowe's, tapped into the Turkish opium market and would ship uh, their drugs on a, sorry, this got out of order, on uh, these little ships. Uh, ships known as, uh, that originated in, in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, known as uh, Baltimore Clippers. These were ships built entirely for speed. Uh, very, very narrow hull, sharp bows, and opium was a very expensive cargo, so you could make a lot of money with speed. And these ships were meant to evade uh, Chinese uh, customs officials and pirates in the uh, uh, Straits and off Malaysia. So these were kind of the drug, drug running boats of their day. Now the typical merchantmen of the time had what was, was definitely not built for speed. They were built with what was called a codfish bow and a mackerel tail, a very blunt bow to basically prevent the ship from diving into the water when going through high seas. And uh, this is a design that had been used since the 16th or 17th century and uh, also offered a lot of cargo capacity. Well, um, starting the 1840s, um, a, n a number of naval architects, including this gentleman, John Willis Griffiths, came up with an idea of like, why don't we take the opium clipper design and just make it bigger and create a faster China packet? Well, the reason for this was the British had done some dirty work for us. In the 1840s, the British go to war with the Chinese over the opium trade and the Royal Navy steams into Canton Harbor and basically massacres thousands of Chinese and destroys the fortifications of Canton and basically forces open Canton and five other Chinese ports to Western trade. And that basically, in the treaty that follows, the Treaty of Nanking of 1842, which is the so start of the so-called century of humiliation, uh, as the Chinese call it, uh, the, Ch the, uh, the uh, China trade greatly expands. And a number of Americans are there during the uh, final battle of the Opium War, including Warren Delano, who watches it happen watches the uh, Chinese get uh, routed in their own city. 
And uh, Warren Delano uh, writes in his diary, he says, well, it's a shame that it had happened this way, but considering how arrogant the Chinese are, they're getting their just dessert. So, uh, <laughs> and a, a number of merchants, including Delano, see this as a wonderful commercial opportunity. So why don't we build bigger versions of these opium clippers that can carry tea faster to America and fetch higher prices? So uh, one of the first clipper ships that is, that is designed along the Baltimore Clipper model, she's about 160 or 70 feet long, so bigger than your typical little schooner, has three masts, is the Sea Witch. This ship, which is designed by Warren Griffiths and is owned by a gentleman named Aspinwall, who is also an ancestor of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, she cuts the typical sailing time from Canton to New York from 120 days to 74 days. She was able to, at a time when a typical China packet could only maybe go around eight or nine knots, she's able to maintain sp speeds of 15 knots. Secrets, the very narrow, sharp hull, and you pile on as much canvas as you can, build your mass as tall as you can, you know, basically cost be damned. This shows an underwater model of uh, what a, uh, an extreme clipper looks like from the early 1850s. This is the clipper ship Young America. I, I love the names of these ships, by the way. Uh, built by William H. Webb in New York, who later would go on to found the Webb Institute. As you can see, she has a wide midsection able to carry a significant amount of cargo and a flat bottom, but very sharp ends. Uh, well, another boost to the clipper ship trade takes place in the uh, in 1848, 1849, when gold is discovered in California. And a lot of the clipper ship operators who are already starting to operate some of these early clippers to, uh, for, to and from China are like, well, wait a minute. We can sell all sorts of goods to miners who are venturing out to California. Everything from dry goods, booze, uh, cheese, furniture, you name it. Everything that's needed to build a great city, that great city that became San Francisco. So in 1849, Warren Delano takes his clipper ship the Memnon, which is also designed by Griffiths, and sails her around from New York, around the f infamous Cape Horn, to San Francisco. Uh, that clipper ship cuts the typical sailing time from 160 days to 120 days. Soon after that, the race is on. Other clipper ship operators begin building custom-built clippers for the California trade, ships that are bigger than the T-clippers, bigger and more powerful, and uh, and to operate these clipper ships uh, in, the, in the California trade, you have some very colorful characters who serve as captains. A lot of these captains are, um, uh, like Bully Bob Waterman was one of the most infamous. Uh, he was captain of the Sea Witch for many, many years, uh, not a one to spare the lash, and these ships were often manned by people who were just wanting to get a free passage to California and then jump ship as soon as they, can, as soon as they land in San Francisco. By the early 1850s, you had a shortage of people that wanted to go to sea. So how did you begin recruiting seamen? Well, uh, you uh, basically the captain speaks to the local saloon operators in the New York waterfronts, the uh, ladies that own and operate the houses of ill repute along the waterfront, and say, we'll pay you a certain amount of money if you slip some opium into their drinks. They pass out. Next thing they know, they're on a clipper ship bound for California, and they have to climb up a mast 200 feet tall. Some of them have never been to sea before. Flogging, by the way, was outlawed by Congress in 1850 on American merchant ships, but that didn't stop uh, these captains from doing it anyway. Some captains, uh, like Captain Nathaniel B. Palmer, who is a prominent figure in my story, uh, was known to treat his crew very well, but many of them were not. Uh, the records set by these ships around uh, the coast, Cal around uh, Cape Horn of California, truly were astonishing. You had many clipper ship races in which Sure, in which people uh, bet huge amounts of money, tens of thousands of dollars upon the outcome. Uh, the Flying Cloud versus the Challenge versus the clipper ship MB Palmer in 1851. Uh, one ship, the James Baines, did the impossible in 1849, 1854. Uh, she was able to log 21 knots per hour uh, under full sail. Now, considering that only a few years before a good t sailing ship could only maybe do around 10 or 11, Pretty amazing uh, uh, feat. And another uh, Boston clipper ship, the Lightning of 1854, uh, she logged 436 miles in a single day. And here's a picture of the infamous uh, Tierra del Fuego. And often uh, to uh, sail 
around Cape Horn, a captain would almost have to go all the way down to Antarctica to fight to catch a wind that can take him around the other way. Because you are going up against, when you're going around the tip of South America, you are uh, basically uh, going into strong westerly winds. You're going against the winds. You can get blown backwards. So often it would take weeks if you were unlucky to go around. But this shows the beautiful clipper ship uh, Red Jacket trying to navigate around uh, basically the ice flows of the Antarctic. Uh, the most famous clipper ship of them all uh, was the Flying Cloud, designed by Donald McKay in Boston. This gives a sense, this painting uh, by Jack Sperling shows how magnificent these tall ships were. I mean, these masts are almost 200 feet tall. And uh, the Flying Cloud made the record passage of 89 days from New York to San Francisco. Now consider only a few years before, 160 days was, was considered to be a good passage. And if you were lucky enough to be like Captain Josiah Perkins Creasy to make a crossing like this, uh, a, sh a clipper ship could pay off her, con her entire fifty dollars to $100,000 building costs in a single voyage selling goods to California, then sailing across to China, picking up tea, and then sailing around the Cape of Good Hope to New York. One voyage. Well, um, as many of you know, uh, this was a very short era, just like the SS United States. The clipper ships came along at a transitional time when steam began competing with the uh, with, uh, with, with uh, the age of sail. Uh, tra the transatlantic trade was quickly taken over by steamships by the 1850s. Uh, they were able to cross in 14 days, the British ships of the Cunard Line. And in 1855, uh, the Panama Pacific opens a small railroad across the pa Isthmus of Panama, 48 mile railroad, which allows passengers and cargo to basically be carried across the Isthmus, sparing them that long voyage around Cape Horn. And uh, British ocean-going steamers by the 1860s were able to sail to China economically. So the era of the great American clipper ships is only last from maybe 1846 to 1855 or 18, maybe 1857 when the Panic of 1857 happens. And the final blow to the American Merchant Marine was the uh, Civil War in which Confederate commerce raiders wreaked havoc on clipper ships, whalers, all sorts of vessels. This is a very sad engraving showing the uh, Confederate steam raider built in England, the CSS Florida, capturing and burning uh, the clipper ship Jacob Bell in 1863. Uh, the uh, CSS Florida ends up uh, making off with, I think, a t shipment of tea worth around $2 million. And that tea is promptly delivered to, to the uh, thirsty citizens of Richmond, Richmond Virginia. So um, anyway, I apologize for going on a bit uh, longer, but uh, I really um, appreciate having you here, and does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, you mentioned the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. It set the speed record crossing uh, in 1905 and won the Kaiser Wilhelm Cup. Mm -hmm. the that speed record held for about 100 years for sale. Oh, for sale, okay, A across the Atlantic. Across the Atlantic. Okay. Did you come across that? I, I did not actually know. Um, but no, I only I I my I, I was following the Cape Horn and China, not the transatlantic by sail. Also, just recently, I saw uh, the largest sailing ship ever built. This came out of the yards in Germany, called the uh, White Pearl. Mm -hmm. It's 468 feet long. It's built for a wealthy Russian uh, <laughs> oil magnate. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've heard about that. I have not. No, I'll 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 look it up. I'd love to to see it. Yes, sir. The clipper ships, uh, quite a few of those were actually disappeared uh, at while at sea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, any comment on what was behind that? I'm, I, I realize the storms and mm -hmm. the vagaries of ocean transit and all that jazz, but uh, any, anything in your research that, uh, that surface that was interesting there? Well, there was uh, one of the early clippers, the Rainbow, which was uh, basically the predecessor to the Sea Witch. It was John Wells Griffith's first clipper. Um, she disappeared, I think, after three years. Uh, she set out from New York going around Cape Horn and was never heard from again. And the theory was that the early clippers were so sharp and so narrow, they dove into the ocean. And the, the rainbow had problems with that early on. I mean, people, when they saw the rainbow on the stocks in 1845, um, a lot of people looked at the ship and said, this is a ship that's inside out. She's not like this, she's like this. And a lot of people thought that Griffiths had gone a bit too far in his copying of the Baltimore Clippers cr to create a seaworthy ship. So on our first few voyages, people noticed that the Rainbow, in fact, in fact did dive a lot and came, was in danger of being swamped. And the theory is that, I mean, she disappeared with all hands. No one ever heard from her again or anyone on board. 
So that might have happened. I think the other way that one of these ships would, would sink was that there was, there was the expression pooped when a uh, wave would come over the stern and swamp it that way. So you know, these ships were also, you know, any wrong turn, if they ever carried too much canvas, they would go over. I mean, one captain of the um, clipper ship Hukwa, named after the great merchant, he was um, almost, his ship was almost sunk off the coast of Indonesia and she was over on her side for an agonizingly long period of time. Thankfully, she had just enough buoyancy to come back up, but the crew had to cut away her masts so she would come back up. So they had a crippled ship, but she wouldn't, that it couldn't, they had no mast, but she was, she was able to go back up. So it was a very dangerous thing. Yes, sir. As an old geezer, I would like to express the gratitude <laughs> of the other old geezers <laughs> in this audience for having two Eight bells lectures <laughs> in the same week. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yes. Oh, yes, sir. <clears throat> I went to sea with people who had sailed out in the United States, mm. and one of them had sailed for the U.S. lines on the America. Mm -hmm. And when World War II came along, he was sailing as second assistant, mm -hmm. and the Navy took the ship over and they cleaned house with people who were questionable. No. And he was the only engineer with the first assistant left. Oh, wow. So then the first assistant was a NENSA, mm -hmm. the Naval Reserve. So they told him to get the ship ready. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm not capable, I'm an ensign. <laughs> and uh, they threatened him with jail, they were gonna shoot him, and he wouldn't do it. Well, he sailed as a commander. Whoa. Oh my yeah, gosh! Rapid promotion. Well, I read somewhere that uh, the, uh, the United States lines uh, during the 30s and, and the 50s, uh, they hired a lot of uh, German Americans on board, and I think when the uh, on, on the SS America when they found a number of German spies who were on board, <laughs> and there was a big scandal with that. But yeah, I mean the, the, there was there was I think and in the 50s too. I spoke with. Um, a uh, number of the crew members, and they said a lot of the crew members, you know, had trained in German ships. They also hired some British people away from the Cunard Line with higher wages. Well, when I was sailing also, we had a mate on board who used to stand deck watches, and he said when he came out of the uh, Mediterranean, there was a lot of traffic, and he said, you didn't bother with the rules of the road. He said, this thing is like a speedboat. He said, you zoom around. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was great to run it. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Steve, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.